We're on with Dan Piakars, who leads the Darts work in healthcare and life sciences. Hey, Dan, thanks very much for giving us a few minutes. How are no you problem. in these crazy times? Uh, doing okay, you know, trying to uh, find the new normal, I guess. So, as someone who sits not in the middle of the of the pandemic, that would be a wrong thing to say, but as someone who leads the Darts practice in in the healthcare healthcare space, maybe frame this situation for for us beyond the obvious of the health impact what are you seeing broader in the world and in the industry as this crisis unfolds yeah i mean you're you're obviously uh the the virus has caused a lot more than just its immediate impact on an individual's health um it pretty much has changed how we have to how we have to go on as a society right now so we're starting to see a lot of different um new new technologies come up to handle everything from you know telemedicine going to the doctor's office to you know people who are stuck at home and may be drinking more and want to stop that there's a company called monument that just came out with a uh, tele addiction service um and we're seeing more and more things like this happen because people are stuck at home and they're not they're not able to live their life as normal and that obviously has an impact you know if you're not able to go to the doctor if you're not able to go see your friends you know if you're not able to go to work uh you know the, the health impact is much broader than the symptoms of the virus itself i've read somewhere with, with, with along the same lines that besides the virus itself there are lots and lots of other medical conditions that are either not treated or giving sort of lower priority, people may not be going to the doctor and not diagnosed on time. Uh, is this sort of felt in your conversations with health, uh, healthcare and life sciences practitioners? Is this felt across the industry? There must be sort of health impact, but also economic impact on, on, on this yeah, industry. So we were talking to one of our uh, large healthcare organization clients, um, and they were explaining that, you know, although they expanded many, many, of their hospitals and basically doubled the amount of beds they had. Um, and at one point they had about 80% of them filled with people with COVID-19 in New York. Um, but because basically the curve has started to flatten, um, the hospital's empty almost. Well, not empty, but a lot more empty than it should be. They're not able to fill beds because people don't want to go to the hospital. So if you have you know, elective surgeries aren't even being allowed or, or they, maybe they just started. Uh, I know it's going to change soon, but this has took a lot of uh, revenue away from the large healthcare organizations. And they, you know, with COVID-19, even though they had so much business from that and the government is providing them with, with support, they're losing money um, because, again, they're not able to open up their, their facilities the way they normally would and people are choosing not to go in. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm sure the effects of that will be felt for years. Are you hearing conversations along these lines? When will patients come back to the healthcare system? Um, well, basically, I, like I said, I actually talked to another hospital here in New Jersey who was having a similar issue, and, and they're worried because they don't know when people are going to come back. And I think for you know for conditions that you can provide services through an urgent care or through telemedicine we're going to see more people doing that but the the hospitals they're doing a good job trying to separate covid 19 patients from other patients um and i think the more they publicize that and show the safety um measures that they're taking the more comfortable people will feel actually going into the facilities All right let's switch gears a little bit and um uh, talk about impact on technology. Uh, I, I understand it may be early, but what do you see people potentially investing into? How will the investment landscape in IT, in healthcare, change mm -hmm. after this is over or to cause this to be over? Any broad thoughts on this? Yeah, so, you know, definitely in, in life sciences, um, because it, we know it's going to take a while to get to a virus, um, there's a lot of technology being put in place, um, leveraging artificial intelligence with bioinformatics information to try to speed up the process of getting to the vaccine. And at the same time, to get to uh, 
therapies that we can use to treat the virus. Um, so doing things like, uh, you know, drug repurposing, trying to understand what drugs, you know, may be able to actually have an impact on this virus. And they're doing that by using artificial intelligence against you know, clinical data to try to understand, you know, how different medications might impact the virus. And that's why we're starting to see more and more of these uh, antiviral drugs coming out. Um, granted, not fully approved, but, you know, they're still being used. Um, you know, so that's what we're seeing inside of uh, the life sciences space. Even, to be honest, even the way uh, one of the companies that is looking to, to bring a, a vaccine to the market, uh, Moderna, even the way they're actually creating the vaccine, they're basically using a, a computer to design it. You know, it's, it's entirely based on artificial intelligence and, you know, messenger RNA, and they're crafting that vaccine. It's a whole new way to actually create vaccines, which is very interesting. Uh, so if, <clears throat> if, um, if we are to believe all these press reports that this may be the record fast vaccine, Mm -hmm. created in under a year or two years relative to decades that it took with some vaccines in the past. It will be in large part thanks to advances in effectively software and the ability to crunch through this tremendous amount of data yeah, for absolutely. vaccine developers. And, and, you know, they're also using uh, um, artificial intelligence to do uh, image analysis for, you know, to identify lung damage, to determine how, uh, um, how far the, the actual illness has progressed. So it's this technology is being used across all aspects of healthcare and life sciences. And it's really moving the ball forward much quicker than we were able to in the past. Mm -hmm. and, and on the IT side of things, I imagine, uh, I mean, I've heard and read this many times that the big complaint with respect to IT in healthcare and patient records, medical services, is how disjointed many of the systems were, how patients have to re-enter their information in multiple systems, how doctors have sometimes, you know, almost fax each other, patient's information between offices and things of that, of that nature. Now that this virus has displayed that everything has to happen so fast, do you think there is sort of, it's mo motivation to, make these systems more connected or is my idea of this disjointed world of healthcare IT outdated? No, you know, interoperability between systems inside of healthcare has been a, a big focus for years. Um, unfortunately, you know, things have moved slower than I, I think the industry would like. Um, and you see a lot of different uh, organizations, healthcare organizations, trying to implement their own health information exchange inside their organization. If they have 20 hospitals, even if some of those hospitals are using different uh, EHR systems, finding a way to actually pull all that data into one place that they can analyze that, you know, so they can understand trends, understand if they're losing patients to, to other facilities. There's all sorts of, uh, you know, all sorts of things you can do when you actually pull the data together um, in a data lake and start leveraging, you know, the value that's inside that data. So you're seeing more and more hospitals do things like this. Despite this loss of revenues because of the virus, because so many of the regular, quote unquote, regular medical procedures are not happening right now, do you see healthcare organizations continue to be able to invest in these technologies? Is it, is it none of it is cheap, right? Yeah, it's, um, I would say it has slowed down at least for the big spend items, but a lot of the healthcare organizations, they're at least trying to look, you know, how do they provide an app or how do they provide some patient engagement around COVID-19, whether it's a symptom tracker, um, you know, or symptom checker to guide people, should they go get tested? Should they, and, and even across things like understanding the difference between the antibody test versus getting tested for um, actual exposure or, or having the virus. Um, you know, people need to understand the differences here. So you see a lot of these healthcare organizations putting out, you know, patient engagement tech around this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, some of the larger uh, things that need to be done around, you know, understanding 
patient data, you know, kind of like the patient 360 view and making sure large organizations have access to that. I think that's going to pick back up, but I think we need to, you know, it's going to take a month or so. The hospitals have to get back to where they feel like, you know, there's not going to be another huge rush that they have to plan for, you know, next month. So I think everybody's being a little cautious. Yeah. One of the things that I find fascinating after this pandemic is how healthcare will be such a much, so much bigger part of so many other industries. I mean, you cannot talk about travel without some kind of healthcare considerations from temperature checks to health assessment, symptoms checker before you board an airplane. I mean, in schools, uh, school nurse used to be sort of there to put some ointment on, on, on if you if you bump your head or something like that. Now that'll be some of the most critical, important people in, in the school system, in the office yeah. environment. It will all be about health and, 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 and precautions. So I bet there is a lot of talk in the industry of how healthcare sort of injects itself in all of these various fields. Do you see that? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, the, the interesting thing is it's a balance between patient privacy and, you know, safety in travel, safety in the society. Um, so, you know, I've, I've had talks with, uh, with people from other companies about, you know, actually what kind of technology can you implement in an airport that balances all of this? Um, you know, there are, there are companies out there looking at thermal, thermal camera technology so that they can analyze and determine if people have a fever just, you know, through a video camera. Uh, you know, also using uh, video, basic, basically uh, video recognition to actually determine if people are socially distancing and following the rules, and if not, to actually be able to take action on that. Um, so there's, you know, a lot of different technology above and beyond just the normal contact tracing apps that everybody's talking about. A lot of different types of technology that can be put in place. Um, it's just about finding that balance between, you know, our privacy and our safety. Very interesting, and I'm sure to be continued. Thanks so much for a few minutes of your time, Dan, um, and good luck with everything you and your practice area has to go, go through. Again, Dan Piakarsh, who leads Data Arts work in healthcare and life sciences. Thanks very much. Thanks, Alexi. Cheers. Have a great day.